Oh, good afternoon. I think we're about ready to begin here. Good afternoon. So I want to welcome you to the 25th annual Elizabeth Tech Lecture, so Silver Jubilee this year. Um, I'm Roger Schrader, SVD, holder of the Lewis J. Elizabeth Tech SVD Chair of Mission and Culture here at CTU. As we gather here this morning, we begin by acknowledging the land on, on which Chicago sits. Today we celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. We acknowledge this land, which was once occupied and revered by the Council of the Three Fires, comprised of the Ojibwa, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations. We thank these inhabitants, original inhabitants of Chicago, for the way that they revered this gracious land. Let us remember all indigenous peoples of the Americas. In particular, I'd like to remember the Lakota people in South Dakota with which CTU, we've had a connection for 40 years now, since 1983. And some of us will be going there on Wednesday to connect with them again on one of our annual trips up there. So I want to think of them in a particular way today as they prepare to welcome us there. At this time now, I'd like to invite our VP and Academic Dean, Fernanda Corre, to offer the CTU welcome. Thank you, Roger, and indeed, it is an appropriate day for Louis Lesbetech Lecture as we honor Indigenous People Day. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Fernando Correa. I'm the Academic Dean of Catholic Theological Union. And on behalf of our president and the CTU family, it is my distinct honor to welcome you to the 25th edition of the Lesbetech Lecture. To those who are here present, and to those joining us on Zoom, a warm welcome to CTU. CTU was founded to participate in the mission of God in the world by preparing men and women for ministry in the church and in the world. This is integral to CTU's core mission and also identity. Since joining CTU as a corporate member of the Chicago province of the Divine World Missionaries, the religious community of Father Louis Lusbetech continues to amplify CTU's commitment to mission in the world and also in the church and to respond to the mandate to preach the gospel across cultures by sponsoring an endowed cheer on mission and culture. This annual lecture appropriately bears the name of Father Louis Dusbetek, a cultural anthropologist and a communically recognized pioneer in the field of missionary anthropology to advance and promote the integral connection between Christianity, mission, people, and culture. Now it is my honor to welcome to the podium Professor Roger Schroeder, the Louis J. Lusbetech Professor of Mission and Culture to introduce our speaker. I'm back again. So as Ferdinand was already saying, this um, lectureship is on behalf of Louis Lusbetech um, SVD. He published a book in 1963, so at the beginning of Vatican II on church and culture. And this, of course, is something that Vatican II would continue to open up to point to the seeds of the word of God in every culture. So he is actually already in 63, the early part of the Vatican II was writing this book. And this book would be very well recognized, not just by Catholic, by Protestants, Evangelicals, conciliar Protestants, and Pentecostals. Later on then, in 1988, he wrote a updated, and when I say update, it's a complete rewrite. Huh? So this, is a, the, this book came out in 1988, and this is what came out, Church and Culture's New Perspectives in Missological Anthropology. And that was really a complete rewrite, taking in light all the Vatican II theology and everything that was going on at that time. Um, I knew uh, Louis, I call him Louis, I knew Louis in person, 
Uh, when he was working on this in 88, I was in Rome at the time doing some doctoral work. And so uh, I got to know him well and helped a little bit here and there with some editorial stuff and that sort of thing like that. But anyways, he's a greatly amount, great amount of work that he did on behalf of the SVDs for the broader church in this regards. Before I introduce our speaker for today, just to mention that there will be a, a Q&A session after the talk. And those that of you are on Zoom, we're going to ask you to just put your questions in the chat, and then I'll be back there to take a look at the questions in the chat. Okay. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker today. It really is an honor for me to introduce my colleague from DePaul University, uh, Dr. Stan Cho Ilo of Nigeria. He's a research professor of world Christianity and African studies at the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology at DePaul. He also is an honorary professor of religion and theology at Durham University in England and visiting research scholar at the Institute of African Studies of the University of Nigeria. So you see he has three current positions on three different continents, huh? <laughs> so he gets a few frequent flyer miles, I suppose, huh, in between there. Um, he, has a doc he has two doctorate degrees. The first is sociology of religion from the University of South Africa, another doctorate in theology from the University of St. Michael's in Toronto. He is also the North American coordinator of the project Doing Theology from the Existential Peripheries, a project of the Dicastery of Integral Human Development of the Holy See. His most recent publications, just to mention the, the last three, Under a Palavar Tree, Post-Vatican II African Ecclesiology in 2023, this year, Handbook of African Catholicism in 2022, and Something Beautiful to God 2020. Um, Dr. Elo or Stan, he also taught the course here, World Christianity, the C3000 course. He taught that here one year for us as part of the partnership understanding between DePaul and CTU. And we are very glad to have had him at that time. So please help me in welcoming uh, Stan Cho Elo. Thank you very much, Roger, and thank you, brothers and sisters. It's a special privilege for me to give this very important lecture. My presentation is divided into three parts. In the first part, I will engage some of the accounts on the shifting center of gravity in world Christianity to Africa. And I will show why these accounts are flawed and very unhelpful for Christian mission both in Africa and in the world. Secondly, I will engage three theories of the shifting center of gravity from the West to Africa and explore the strengths and weaknesses of these approaches. Finally, I will suggest that a missional intercultural theological approach is more suitable for interpreting world Christianity today because it decenters the framework that places one cultural appropriation of Christianity over the other, as was the case in Christendom ideas and projects and the currents of ultramontanism in the Catholic Church. As Bernard Lonegan asserts, the Christian message is to be communicated to all nations. Such communication presupposes that preachers and teachers enlarge their horizons to include an accurate and intimate understanding of the culture and the language of the people they address. They must use those virtual resources creatively so that the Christian message becomes no disruptive of the culture, not an alien part superimposed upon it, but a line of development within the culture. The Christian mission of the future, I propose, will be a faith which will work together with other faiths and indeed entire humanity in the search for human and cosmic flourishing. It will surely pursue evangelical and catechetical goals as an instrument for bringing about the eschatological fruits of the reign of God in history, but mission must proceed from a place of vulnerability and humility. It will have to frame her mission in prophetic terms by integrating the social context and the social location of people and embrace 
multiple loci of enunciation in the development of appropriate language and grammar of assent and face demands on the people. I'd like to propose eight frontiers of theology and mission today where scholars and pastoral agents must focus the church's missionary practice today, namely, one, mission to the peripheries and doing theology from the peripheries. Two, in the, when it was advertised, it says five, but I've been very enriched by people who read my work and gave me some feedback. And so I have expanded that to eight, and I'm also happy to receive some feedback here. I can keep on increasing the number before, <laughs> before the book that I'm publishing with the same title will appear. Number two, mission to the sick and doing theology from the wounds, brokenness, and sickness of God's people today, especially the poor. Number three, mission for ecological conversion and doing an eco-theology and ethics for cosmic flourishing. As Thomas Berry noted, we cannot have healthy people in a sick planet. And I will add, we cannot do mission in a sick planet. Number four, mission of peace and reconciliation to heal the world of wars, violence, hatred, suffering, and exclusion, and doing a theology of gospel nonviolence, already what we see happening in the Holy Land kind of reinforces the need for our world today to embrace the path of peace, reconciliation, and gospel nonviolence. Number five, mission for world creation and doing theology for a poor church for the poor and with the poor so that God's people will be lifted up from the scandalous poverty afflicting a greater part of God's people on planet Earth. Number six, mission of hope and developing a theology of hope through a political theology for an uncertain and fear-filled world. Mission must demonstrate what hope looks like and why being a Christian offers one the possibility of entering into a realm of hope. Number seven, mission to families and developing a theology of mysterium familiae. Number eight, mission to a digital world and developing a theology for digital faith influencing and evangelization, particularly for our young people who are disaffiliating from church and religion while being heavily invested on social media with a daily reality connected and defined by the new world of AI and CHAP GPT. Now, it is very impossible for me to develop all these eight today, but I will set a framework around which we can have a conversation around these eight frontiers. Some of these eight frontiers already have been proposed in mission studies and the missionary practice of the church in the last 50 years, so some of them are not new. But there has not been any effort to present them together as the expanded and interlinked horizon within which mission is to be carried out in the world today. But I present them as a response to some important questions, insights, inspirations, and prompts that I have received in the course of the last five years when I've been thinking intentionally about a better possible world and a better possible church. First, first uh, one of the inspirations is the demand that Justo Gonzalez made in his foreword to Stephen Bevans and Roger Schroeder's important book, Constance in Context, A Theology of Mission Today, where he argues that all our efforts to make the gospel concrete in building on one another's work must begin with taking ongoing history as God's shepherding of creation and taking it as the basic category for understanding the good news of the gospel. A second inspiration, again, from Bevans and Schroeder in the section on Constance in Context on Prophetic Dialogue, 
the, the recommended pathway to doing theology today is prophetic dialogue. And they allude to some of the frontiers that I am proposing here when they write, and I quote, as citizens of what is now the most powerful and most affluent nation in the world, we have been challenged afresh to make our own commitment of justice, peace, and integrity of creation that will alter the structures which maintain poverty, violence, and ecological disaster from which we, US Americans, often profit. So here, Bevans and Schroeder invite us to take the issues of poverty, ecology, justice, peace, and reconciliation, which is uh, Robert Schreiter's uh, uh, categorization of what mission should focus attention. So these scholars invite us to take these areas uh, to heart and also invite us to embrace interreligious and intercultural dialogue for a changing world in which the contexts are changing even though there are constants that do not change. Third is the influence of David Bosch in his monumental work, Transforming Mission, Paradigm Shifts in Theology of Mission. The late South African missiologist wrote of the blurring of the eschatological horizon in mission studies. Citing the works of Einst Troist, he bemoans the fact that the eschatological office is closed in contemporary mission study and practice. Where then is hope for the world in the missionary practice of churches? How can we say to the poor, the broken, the battered, and the wounded to hope for a better future by embracing the gospel of Jesus Christ? To put it in the words of the Ugandan theologian, Emmanuel Katongole, in his book, Born from Lament, the Theology and Politics of Hope in Africa, what does hope look like in the world? Hope is not achievement. Hope is something concrete. What does it look like in the world today? Bosch proposes, then, that the gospel of salvation and the gospel of liberation must spring forth from a mission that is conceived as action in hope, that holds in creative and redemptive tension the already and the not yet, the world of sin and rebellion, and the world God loves, the new age that has already begun, and the old that has not yet ended. He writes with so much conviction on Christian hope this way, and I quote, Christian hope does not spring from despair, about the present. We hope because of what we have already experienced. Christian hope is both possession and yearning, repose and activity, arrival and being on the way. Since God's victory is certain, believers can work, with, can work both patiently and enthusiastically, blending carefully planning with urgent obedience, motivated in what he calls the patient impatience of the Christian hope. In the penultimate page of this important work, to which I have returned again and again since reading the book 15 years ago as a, master, a master's degree student, Bosch touches on something that is quite shocking and true of mission. Referring to the work of Van der Alst, Bosch pointed out that the churches have been good with proclaiming orthodoxy, but poor on orthopraxis. There have been countless councils and synods in our church's history about right belief, but there has never been a council or a synod convoked to speak on how we can love one another. What is the Christian implication of the greatest commandment? Bosch is pointing to the forgetfulness of this elemental foundation of the gospel and of the Christian faith, love. All mission activities then must begin with what Hans Us von Balthasar calls the crystallization of love in the community, which becomes a verifiable experience that attracts people to the faith community because it is good news to experience God's love incarnate in the witness of a community where love and charity abide. In this regard, 
Bosch argues that it is not the church which undertakes mission. It is the missio dei which constitutes the church. Mission, therefore, is not competition with other religions. Mission is not conversion activities. Mission is not about expanding the faith and building churches or raising money. Mission is not social, economic, and political activity, not building giant monuments, or even building the kingdom of God with human plans, plots, and stratagem. Mission is not simply about population growth of church membership. Indeed, while mission may involve some of these, there is need, according to Bosch, to renew and reconceive and reimagine mission by constantly interpreting the signs of the times. Finally, what I would say for the most part of this paper is inspired by Pope Francis. Pope Francis invites the church to embrace a missionary conversion. One quote of Pope Francis that captures the connection between missionary and pastoral conversion very well is a speech he gave at the International Conference on Pastoral Work for Vocations on October the 21st, 2016, when the Pope speaks of the style of pastoral ministry needed for our times. Pope Francis says, this is how I like to think of the style of pastoral ministry. And if I may, at the same time, I imagine the gaze of each pastor, attentive, not hurried, able to stop and look deeply to enter the life of another without ever making the person feel threatened or judged. It is a look of discernment which accompanies people without taking over their conscience and without pretending to control the grace of God. And in Evangelii Gaudium, he says, I dream of a missionary option, that is, a missionary impulse capable of transforming everything so that the church's customs, ways of doing things, times and schedules, language and structures can be suitably channeled for the evangelization of today's world rather than for the church's self-preservation. The renewal of structures demanded by pastoral conversion can only be understood in this light as part of an effort to make all the structures of our church more mission oriented. So my definition of missionary conversion is that it requires reform and renewal of church institutions. It requires the, re the, the reform and renewal of the universal church itself so that everything we do will focus on the mission of God, the Missio Dei, and not on ourselves, our plans, our cultures, our powers, our privileges, and you name it. This will require combating the modern temptations of secularism, moral relativism, materialism, the idols of neoliberal capitalism, the idols of nations, of race, ethnicity, clan, religion, and ideologies of power and domination, and overcoming the idols of attachment to repetitive institutional practices and rules that have become merely routine, old, ineffective, and sometimes an obstacle to the work of God for today. So let us look at some of the claims about the Center for World Christianity. And I will skip through this because uh, you all know the claim that Africa is the center of world Catholicism. I think it's very, very appealing to me as an African, but this is something that I strongly object to. Africa is not the center of Christianity and there has never been any particular geographical center of Christianity, and you will see why. Even Bevans and Schroeder write about this with so much eloquence. They say, and I quote, today we recognize that the missionary era began in the 15th century within the age of discovery has come to an end. We are faced with a challenge to the constants of the gospel in a new context. With the collapse of colonialism, the renaissance of the religions of the world, 
the recession of Christianity in Europe, and they say the overall shift of the center of gravity within Christianity, migrations of the third world to the first, the advent of rapid transport, satellite communication, and the emergence of globalization, a new age of mission has begun. It struck me last year as I updated my materials for teaching a course here at CTU on world Christianity that the important voices in this area have been historians, sociologists, and anthropologists, or scholars of religious studies. There are definitely some theologians and missiologists in this camp, but what has predominated has been driven by conceptual and theoretical frameworks that have been restricted by the canons of religious studies, sociology, and anthropology, as well as tools taken from those fields for interpreting, understanding, and judging the Christian expansion globally. I must add here that all theologies are missional in nature but not all mission studies are theological in nature. However, it is not always clear when these theories talk about shifting centers, what they mean by Christianity, what constitutes the centering of Christianity, or what they mean by shifting centers beyond the claims of demographic, social, and cultural history of Christian expansion. Furthermore, the field of world Christianity and the methods for studying it continue to evolve, pointing more to a divergence in understanding the field than a convergence in both method and subject matter. What is becoming clear to me in my research is the need for greater expansion of the theoretical and conceptual frameworks and the adoption of a more theological and missional approach to intercultural and interdisciplinary approach to studies of Christian expansion, but most importantly, that we must pay attention to what God is up to in the histories of people who are embracing or rejecting Christianity today and clearly identifying what mission means for today, what it has always meant for believers, and how we can identify the footprints of God in the contradictions, complexities, and groaning of creation today for a new earth and a new heaven. Thus, the claim made about world Christianity and its variants and features in Africa and elsewhere necessarily must be rethought in ways that give value to the actual fate and context of Africans and the answers that people in my village, for instance, are giving to the question, for instance, who is God? Why should I believe in God? Who is Jesus Christ? Why should I believe that Jesus is risen from the dead if I still see my life as hanging still on the cross of pain, suffering, and poverty? And what are the experiences of believers in these places where we claim constitute the center of Christianity? My proposal is that the center of Christianity has always transcended space, geography, or place. Even though the missionary mandate had a territorial frame, the missionary work was not to be implemented with imperial scheme and secular stratagem that characterized some of the missionary advance beyond the West that was mediated through the projects, ideals, and goals of a defunct Christendom. I wish to touch on two methods that have tried to advance this theory. First is, the ones developed by some African scholars, including Andrew Walls. Now, the theory goes that when you look at the statistics, and so it's so true, if you look at the stats, it seems that Christian numbers uh, is growing in Africa and diminishing elsewhere. But I want to say that it is important to note that scholars should not use the figures of statistics to paint an unduly rosy and, triumph and triumphalist picture of African Christianity. There is need for caution and a critical reading of these data. This is because most demographic data of African Catholic population growth do not also distinguish between the growth in the general population in Africa and the growth 
in the number of Christians. These statistics fail to consider the fact that the exponential growth in the population of Christians in post Second Vatican Council African Church has not been the result of evangelization or conversion. So it's not as if to say that Catholicism is converting people now from African traditional religion or from Islam. Rather, I call it a genetic growth, which is that Catholic families raise their, their families Catholic, rather than maybe Catholics converting, quote unquote, converting people from Pentecostalism or evangelical churches. Actually, the Catholic Church is bleeding numbers, not only in Africa, but also in Brazil, in Philippines, in Haiti. So we must be conscious of uh, oversimplifying demographic growth. The demographic prognosis that we are looking at is only going to be true if sociological trends that we think exist, if it holds. But you remember that at the beginning of the last century, you know the magazine Christian Century. That was also uh, the World Missionary Congress in 1910. This euphoria, and even the Pope in Infermo Proposito, makes this claim that the world civilization is Christian, otherwise it is nothing. There was a hope that the 20th century would be the Christian century, hence that uh, magazine, Christian Century. But alas, we all can look at, I mean, did the Christian century succeed or did it not? I mean, the same, the same kind of uh, euphoria and joy was also captured in North Africa, in the church of Carthage and Alexandria in the first 500 years of the history of Christianity. Tertullian, one of the African fathers of the church, was singing the praises of Christian expansion in Africa in the third century. And Tertullian said, we are just but yesterday, but we have filled every place among you, cities, islands, fortresses, towns, marketplaces, the very camps, tribes, companies, palace, senate, forum. That was Tertullian singing of the praises of Christianity in Africa in the first 300 years. Those places where Tertullian sang the praises, you do not find any more churches Hence, the need for us to be cautious about how we theorize Christian expansion based on population. Now, three points I want to make to conclude this part of the presentation. First, the theorization of Africa as a center for Christianity is not supported by any significant and consistent biblical, theological, and missional criteria about what being a center of Christianity means or what Christianity means. Whether you look at it in terms of the three selves of missiology, in terms of sustenance, for instance, perpetuation of ESF or leadership, most of the churches in Africa, the Catholic Church I'm sure of, are totally dependent for their sustenance on Western churches. So we can name other, other examples. And the second point is that the center periphery narrative I think, is a continuation of this imperial mindset of Christendom, born of the center-periphery global flow of missionaries and aid from the West to Africa. The narrative of center and peripheries of Christianity is an invented map of a Christian world that does not exist anywhere. This is because, in truth, the gospel message in Africa is being received in diverse sites, and in diverse forms that do not display any homogeneous map. The gospel message is being proclaimed to a people whose social conditions and history have become much more complex and convoluted than in the past, needing a reimagination of the content, context, and relevance of Christianity to the survival of God's people in Africa. The center periphery narratives are truly an example of an elitist account of mission. It is often told without attention to the hopes, cries, and anxieties of the poor from the existential peripheries of Africa. Those who drive this narrative are mainly Western-based scholars like me and some local African church leaders. 
In most instances, they ignore the most pressing challenges facing African peoples and their own failings in valorizing the potential capacity of the Christian gospel for reinventing the future in Africa from ground up. These predominant narratives of world Christianity and Africa's place are simply a limiting comparative interpretation of Africa's response to the gospel message with what has happened elsewhere, while relating what is happening in Africa with factors and predictions about a global movement of which Africa still continues to be very marginal. The quotidian issues facing most Africans should be the compass through which church leaders and scholars must navigate the movement of the spirit in history in Africa to judge how Christianity is shaping or hampering Africa from being a continent of human and cosmic flourishing. Finally, whereas the agency of African Christians and cultures are affirmed in this narrative, theorists have not addressed what the agency is vis-a-vis -vis other religious groups in Africa. The worlding of Christianity in Africa has thus projected the Christian momentum in Africa as the history of everything Africa. This narrow account minimizes the roles of other religious and political groups and social and cultural actors and agents in Africa. This narrative often fails to explore some of the intercultural and interreligious currents in Africa and in most parts of the world where Christianity is only but one player in the bigger scheme of things. The narrative of shifting boundaries and centers is thus pre predominated by demographic data, cultural, social history, without a critical attention in the academic study of world Christianity to the failings of Christian groups and individuals in responding to the African predicament. There is a lack of commitment to the limitations of African cultures, the fragmentation of African societies, the persistent dependence of African churches, especially mainline churches like the Catholic Church on foreign aid and mission grants, and the absence of any strong praxis, spiritual, moral, emerging from African Christianity for the reversal of the false convergence of history and the contestations and crises in Africa today because of modernity. So it is more important to pay attention to what is happening on the ground. And I think that is what I want to focus on, especially to look at the method of studying Christianity that has been called the world Christianity methodology. Martha Fredericks helps us in her approach to grapple head on with this center periphery framework and to deconstruct the regnant framework that claims a geographical, regional, or continental center of world Christianity. Indeed, from its origins and based on the missionary mandate, Christianity has always been global but it is also not totally of this world. According to Fredericks, a world Christianity approach to studying world Christianity recognizes the inherent character, plural character of Christianity. It entails the conscious and consistent endeavor to study particular Christian communities, beliefs or practices in the light of and in relation to Christianity's wider history, mindful of the integrative and globalizing forces, as well as its multiple centers, trajectories, and agents, aware that Christianity's manifestations always shape and are shaped by broader political, socioeconomic, and religious development, and cognizant of the diversity of beliefs and practices this has produced across time and space. Frederick's definition advances the study of this field further beyond triumphalism by departing from demographic advantage in what Lamin Sané calls changes that gave new meaning to the pace and significance of numerical expansion. The approach does not minimize the impact of numerical presence, and I do not minimize 
the impact of population, but it seeks to focus on other diverse centers of power, spirituality, authority, and influence in Christianity beyond the north-south demographic binaries and geopolitical maps. Places like Guadalupe, Fatima, Assisi, Lourdes, Jerusalem, and Kibeho in Rwanda. These are centers of Christianity. They are centers of world Christianity. These sites draw millions of pilgrims from everywhere and mediate transnational beliefs, practices, and communities of exchange that endure over time. World Christianity as a method thus invites scholars and practitioners to pay greater attention to the multifaceted translocal connectivities of diverse experiences, history, ecclesial traditions of Christian communities throughout the world. It also seeks to discern the experiences of Christian communities and the Christian mission itself in its peregrination across cultural, spiritual, and geographical frontiers. This method thus pays greater attention to how Christian traditions are being formed by entanglements with local and global political, economic, social, and cultural contexts, as well as of Christian and other faith traditions. Frederick helps us to read particular and global experiences of Christianity through a hermeneutic of multiplicity. The experiences of communities of faith are to be read as an open narrative that is constantly fluid and irreducible to sociological categories or narrow prism of university or synchronicity, even in particular culture zones. In engaging Gonzalez's dissection of the old map versus the new polycentric maps of Christian history, and the movement away from reading North Atlantic Christianity as the goal of Christian history. I wish to demonstrate the importance of recognizing local processes, regional, continental specificity about the cultural and sociological history of changes that Christianity brought to these regions. However, the polycentric map is also evident in regional experiences of Christianity. Even in West Africa, where I come from, there are multiplicities between Christianity in Ghana and Christianity in Nigeria. Christianity in French-speaking West Africa, even our neighbor, Benin, and Christianity in Nigeria. So we must pay attention to these specific specificities. As a result, one cannot read African Christianity as a single story, mediated solely through Western missionaries' presence in Africa. Rather, one should develop an expanded gaze on the vitality of the multiple manifestations of the Christian traditions in Africa. And this is not only in Africa, but also in Asia, in Latin America, in Oceania, even here in North America. I mean, in the polarization we find ourselves in here in the United States now, if you tell me the diocese you're going to celebrate mass in, a, you know, I would tell you whether it is conservative or whether it's liberal, isn't it? Now, I ask the question always, can we actually worship at the same altar? Or is now the altar is now uh, conservative or uh, uh, liberal, is it? So you have blue, blue altars and red altars. You know, those who want to make the church great again, and those who want, <laughs> and, those, and those who want, who want, who want to change the church. So, the question has to be more complex, and the consideration more complex beyond simply uh, the simplification of Christianity to simply the tyranny of numbers. This wrong-headed map. I think, is far removed from the Bible. And I want to use the biblical evidence to demonstrate that even from biblical history, this idea of centers and peripheries do not add up. Centers from the biblical tradition 
are locations where God is present among God's people. We can give examples of such centers in the biblical tradition, like the theophany of the burning bush, when God called Moses to lead the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, or the Pentecost experience, or the appearance of the Lord to Saul on the way to Damascus, or the appearance of the risen Lord to the disciples on the way to Emmaus, and the revelation of the risen Lord in the breaking of bread. These are centers of Christianity. In other words, every setting where people are gathered in the name of the Lord is a center of Christian mission. In that sense, every center is a potential periphery, and every periphery is a potential center. The existential peripheries, the prisons, the migrant holding centers, seniors' homes, the celebration of the seven sacraments, they are all centers of Christianity because in these sites, we can see the enactment of the self-sacrificing love of God in Christ made manifest, celebrated, or lived out in history concretely as well as through popular piety, places of worship, and even in the digital and virtual world where many young people are connecting with the message of the gospel. More so for us in the Catholic tradition, the Eucharist is the center of Christianity, is the center of the life of the community. The self-sacrificing love of the Son of God that is enacted in the Eucharistic uh, celebration has a unifying character as it draws everyone to the loving embrace of God who is the center of the life of the community. The memory of the crucified and risen Lord challenges worshipers to transcend the particularities of the social hierarchies and exclusionary practices that wound or divide the body of Christ and the members. As William Kavanaugh writes, the Eucharist is a decentered center. The Eucharist is a decentered center. It is celebrated in the multitude of local churches scattered throughout the world with a great diversity of rites, music, and liturgical spaces. It is precisely this fact that complexifies the calculus of particular and universal within the church Catholic. Thus, in this reasoning, one can reimagine the meaning of center and peripheries by a movement of the spirit into the transcendent nature of the mystery that is celebrated on the altar and how it breaks the barriers of power and privilege, imprisonment to our small prisons of nations, tribes, creeds, or classes, calling everyone to the crystallization of love at that center that is without limit. There is also another element in the Eucharist. It invites worshipers to self-sacrificing witness beyond the gathered assembly, moving out to the four ends of the earth. And then it transports believers and worshipers to contemplation and witness to the eschatological nature of our common pilgrimage and the concreteness of our human experience of faith and life. This is because God is found where people gather in God's name to celebrate love and thank God for that love in the Eucharist. It is in the hope of being taken beyond their particular locations that believers find in the Eucharist this source of strength and source of community and source of empowerment. Now, I'd like to move to the final part of this presentation. Now, what does this mean for the eight new frontiers that I present? First, my proposal is that mission today requires missional intercultural theology. And this I capture in the proposal of Pope Francis, what Pope Francis calls a culture of encounter. Now, Pope Francis proposes the culture of encounter as a way of seeing God's presence in the other. So this is an incarnational moment is also a moment of revelation. The other, the face of the other, actually helps me 
to see God. I can read the gospel anew in my encounter with, with the other. It is also through this encounter that I can begin to understand and interpret what goes on in the life of the other. So actually, if you use the parable of the Good Samaritan, you can see four movements in this. First is what I call the kenotic moment. The, the man who was traveling saw a wounded man, and then he stepped into that pain. And then you can see, then the next moment is the diagnostic moment. Then he is able to perceive, by stepping into this, to perceive clearly this man is in need of help. He did not have to ask whether this guy is an immigrant, whether he's a Christian or a Muslim, whether he's white or black, gay or straight. He was concerned because he already had a framework that is driven by a certain perception of reality that transcends just particularity of his own immediate concerns. He was not concerned about his danger or whatever. There he did the diagnostics, understanding what's going on, interpreting immediately. Then there is the pragmatic moment. Then what should I do? The question they asked Peter at Pentecost, brethren, what should we do? Immediately he starts to act. And then he lifted the man onto his mule and then takes him, action, takes him to the inn, which some people like St. Augustine and many other fathers translate as the church, where there is transformation at the end. So we find these four movements that begins with a culture of encounter. And that's what Pope Francis is saying, that the other shouldn't frighten me, rather the other should open up in me a new way of seeing reality, a new way of seeing God. So this is a paradigm shift in understanding and implementing the missionary practice of the church today as mutual accompaniment that invites the missiologist, the theologian, the pastoral agent to move away from single narrative of culture, of persons or identity, as Pope Francis writes in Fratelli Tutti number 12, to a more expansive embrace of the mutual connectivity among us, humans, God, and nature. The culture of encounter can inspire an intersubjective openness to receiving from the other something that I cannot offer myself. It invites us to embrace the reality of our own incompleteness. In Veritatis Gaudium, Pope Francis proposes that the good theologian, the good missiologist, the good philosopher has an open mind, a mind that is incomplete and always open to the expansion and development of the truth. What Pope Francis calls a culture of encounter is properly the central direction of an intercultural missional disposition and missional praxis. Now, the instrumental labor is just to cite the ongoing synod for the ongoing synod on synodality repeatedly spoke of incompletion in that document five times. The instrumenting laboris proposes that everyone in the community has something to offer and affirm the irreducible uniqueness of each member. Our common baptism is presented as the foundation for the recognition of the contribution of each person. However, the document admits of a mission that proceeds from the affirmation of our incompleteness. Quoting the document, it says, at the same time, each person is invited to acknowledge his or her own incompleteness, and therefore, the awareness that in the fullness of mission, everyone is needed, everyone counts. In this sense, mission also has a constitutive synodal dimension. In deciding to journey with another, I admit that I cannot journey alone. The document also affirms what mission is. Mission is not the marketing of a religious product, but the construction of a community in which relationships are a manifestation of God's love. And therefore, the very life of this proclamation 
is the love of God that cannot be surpassed. So the culture of encounter is the design that liberates mission from being self-mediation of the church, of the missionary, of the theologian, to a mutually graced self-mediation between multiple subjects in our common search for the path to our collective future and for abundant life and human and cosmic flourishing that the Son of God promised to all those who love God. I like to go to the seven frontiers as a way of concluding this lecture. I have described in my previous work that the teaching of Pope Francis on the church is an illuminative ecclesiology because it begins with the question, where is the church rather than who is the church? Illuminative ecclesiology answers the question, what form of witnessing and proclamation can someone experience in every instance of the life of Christians, in the priorities and practices of churches and their leaders, which will point to Christ and show the face of the world to God and the merciful and loving and compassionate face of God to a wounded and broken world. In other words, illuminative ecclesiology articulates the form of witnessing and proclamation which can be experienced in this fourfold moment of kenosis, the incarnational revelational moment, diagnosis, interpreting and understanding what goes on in the life of people, and pragmatic, trying to do something about it, and then together with that person, moving to the transformative experience that everyone is longing for in their encounter with the other. So everyone, every reality in this kind of ecclesiology is capable of bearing the light of Christ and sharing the same light with everyone. So everyone is welcomed into the church. The church is God's capacious space, or like the synod image calls it the wide tent, where all can find a place and a space for love. Through this form of witnessing and proclamation, the people of God are offered the gift of the welcoming, merciful, loving, and compassionate face of God on one hand. On the other hand, the people of God receive through the ministry of the church the imponderable offer of God's liberating and transforming love, healing, and grace. In Pope Francis, the crystallization of love that happens through the illuminative church happens when the church in her missionary practice is interested not in who she is, but where she is, with whom she is hanging out. It is in the location of the church where two or more are gathered in the name of the Lord and doing what Jesus spent his time doing on earth that we can find the church's true identity. Interestingly, it is in such obscure locations that the light of Christ shines the brightest. William Gregory writes that Pope Francis's ecclesiology can best be understood through his missionary and institutional reforms that calls on all Christians to go out. What Pope Francis wants every Christian to know, according to Gregory, is that mission is an essential and required part of Christian identity. It is not optional. But more than obli an obligation, it is the transcendental path to a life of hope, joy for a wounded and broken world. Mission is mercy, tenderness, compassion, peace, solidarity, and care for others in imitation of the infinite love of God. So the fundamental missionary question that we all must answer as we undertake this journey to these eight frontiers, how can the church be institutionally structured and governed so as to prioritize mission in every action with a missionary key? This, I think, is the perennial question facing the church every day and facing Christians. 
How can the church be better run and organized in order to help all faithful and the world that is waiting out there to fulfill the missionary desire at the heart of God, the Missio Dei? And how can the church witness to the gospel in a more authentic and attractive way? The kind of church which we are talking about is the church that articulates mission as central to her practices and priorities by going out to the frontiers, confident in the gifts of Missio Dei that she has received. In this case, I agree with Stephen Bevans that the missionary church today is more than a blueprint church. As he argues, I'm advocating not some abstract reality, but a community that is constantly discerning and responding to God's prophetic action in the world. And so constantly moving, constantly changing, constantly on the move. In this sense, I am not offering a blueprint as much as a compass for a pilgrim church to find its way and its identity in the world, unquote. And so the eight peripheries that I present to you are the eight peripheries that we, with our compass, can begin to find. Let me talk briefly about them and conclude this lecture. Four of the sites that I present to you became more evident to me in my research on how the church in North America, Africa, and Latin America responded to COVID-19. And as we become clear so far that, for me, mission, missionary priorities and practices are not fixed. So these eight, these eight frontiers can change tomorrow. So these four, the first one, I started to think about this because of COVID-19. I'm thinking of the sites inhabited by the poor. And all of us, all of us humanity in our vulnerability and precarity. During COVID, there's no, no person here who was not scared. So we must enter, just as we encounter the sick, we are also encountering our, our own selves, in our own sickness, in our own wounds, in the emptiness in the human heart. I think of the social determinants of health. Why is it that COVID had a preferential option for black people and brown people here in the, in the United States, in the UK? Why? Why is it that the comorbidities that made black and brown people more susceptible to death and dire outcome from COVID took flesh in black and brown people rather than the word of God and the love of God taking flesh in them. Now, we don't have time to go into all the things I wrote here, but more than 20 years ago, the World Council of Churches pointed to this in 2001 in the plan of action proposed in Nairobi when HIV AIDS was devastating Africa. The churches said that the pandemic with its destructive force makes this pandemic, a new frontier for mission and faith. That was more than 22 years ago. And I say that COVID-19 and the new infectious diseases and the fact that there are millions of God's people who are dying today from preventable and treatable diseases makes it imperative on us to think of sickness, diseases, and the pain and suffering of so many as a center for world mission. Now, during the COVID again, we, I, we realize that the virtualization of mass, Zoom, social media, brought into sharper focus for me that mission and theology must take seriously the digital space as the new Areopagos where the battle for the souls of our young people are being fought and lost. The Dicastery for Communication stated in the opening of a, of a document uh, they released this year, Towards Full Presence, that great strides have been made in the digital age. But one of the pressing issues yet to be addressed is 
how we as individuals and as an ecclesial community are to live in the digital world as loving neighbors who are genuinely present and attentive to each other on our common journey along the digital highway. The fourth is our fragile and bleeding earth. That is our sick planet, which affects all of us in the existential threats that we face because of climate change. In his document, Apostolic Exhortation, Laudate Deum, Pope Francis says, yet with the passage of time, I have realized that our responses have not been adequate. While the world in which we live is collapsing and may be nearing the breaking point, in addition to this possibility, it is indubitable that the impact of climate change will increasingly destroy the lives and families of many persons. On the other hand, the other four, the other four frontiers became clear to me in my current work as the North American Regional Coordinator of the project doing theology from the existential periphery, an initiative of the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development, which accompanies the current synodal process with stories from everyday Catholics that we see as an expression of the sensus fidei fidelium. Now, first is those who inhabit the existential peripheries, and I will conclude my remarks with uh, that very moving experience I had in El Paso and in Ciudad Juarez at the border, at the southern border. Second, the question of war and peace already mentioned that we must develop a culture of peace and reconciliation and the theology of gospel nonviolence. Because most of the migrants that I met in my work, either in northern Uganda at a place called Ajumani, close to half a million Sudanese, Congolese, Somalians lo lo lodging there, some of them who are teenagers who were born in refugee camps. Indeed, the African delegates at the Synod had resisted and they are still pressing that the use of tent as image reminds them of something really terrible. Because if you've lived in the tent, like some of us have, when they tell you that you want to join the church as the tent where everyone is to be accommodated, you say, sorry, I don't want to be in that tent. So, because that's just going to take me back to my experiences of war. And those people we see, these uh, missionary, uh, these uh, refugees, they were all as a result of war, um, ecological disaster, and many other problems. So, we must also think of the family today the contestations about the family on divorce, remarriage, communion for divorced and remarried Catholics, and the so-called divorce orphans, polygamy, same-sex marriage, birth control, abortion, inheritance law, you name it. These, I, I think, should constitute an essential frontier of mission today. Finally, the destructive politics of our times. The economies of scale and the search for hope for the world. Where do we find hope? What role does politics play in mission? Where is the church in today's politics? On whose sides are our churches on when we consider the bigger questions of the day? On war, for instance, the escalation in the Holy Land, where is the church? The economy of ex exclusion and expulsion, where is the church? on issues of immigration, gender equality, social policies. Where do our churches stand with rising authoritarianism, even here in the United States? Illiberal democracies, gun violence, demagogues, popular movement, extremism, racism, and all forms of what I called unredeemed nativistic particularism. Where is the church in all this? So, we must take a movement away from a mission that is preoccupied with who is the church to a mission that is a Copernican revolution 
that thinks of where is the church. Conclusion. There are four principles that I leave for you as we come to the end of this paper. The first is that the ecclesiology that embraces these frontiers is one that begins with where is the church and it is also the condition, the subjective condition for authenticity as a missiologist, as a theologian. So you can also ask the question, where am I? Where do I stand? And this question, where, is very, very important. If you go to the Bible, at the beginning, during, during the fall, the question God asked our first parents, he didn't say, who are you? He says, where are you? When there was the killing of uh, Cain, uh, Abel by Cain, the question God asked is not, who are you? God asked, where is your brother? And we can give more examples. Again, when, when God met Moses in the burning bush, he says, where you are standing is holy ground. So we can ask ourselves, and Jesus says, where two or more are gathered? So I like this constancy of where. You know, St. Paul, where love and charity, where love and charity uh, abide, um, God, there God is found. You can think of the many where's. So we can ask the primary locus of community has to be located in those sites where what is touching and moving God's heart moves each and every one of us. And then we become agents in the crystallization of love. The second principle is that the pilgrim nature of the church on mission offers a dynamic element to the work of proclaiming and reenacting the love of God in people's history. The perennial challenge of mission is the danger of attempting a neat definition of mission. Rather than stepping into mission, knowing that we stand on holy ground at these frontiers. Finally, when one makes this shift from who to where, one can experience our mutual implication in what goes on anywhere and everywhere in the world. There is also a freedom or liberality of mind and heart that moves the missiologists, for instance, from one frontier to another. These frontiers are interlinked, they're interconnected. You cannot talk about sickness today without talking about ecology. We cannot talk about ecology and sickness today without talking about war. We cannot talk about hope in the world without addressing poverty. We cannot talk about poverty in the world without looking at how it affects families. So these are all interlinked. And I'm saying that looking at them together can help us to see that already there are things happening at multiple sites and peripheries of life. The Holy Spirit is already moving ahead of us. I saw in migrants when I went to uh, Ciudad Juarez, these people that came from all the countries of Latin America, Central America, they were all in one place and they were praying and dancing together. They didn't ask this person, are you in a state of grace? Or are you Catholic? Or are you Protestant or Pentecostals? They were all together. The Holy Spirit was already ahead of me when we went there. And so whatever they were saying, we should tell the Pope, already the Holy Spirit has spoken to me through their tears that actually revealed to me the nakedness of our common humanity. So the mission is God's, and God is sending us out there and the question is, where is God? This is a question that I wish to use to conclude because that's a question that Alejandro asked me when he gave me a stone, the last place where he said goodbye to his brother and his brother disappeared. This is in Mexico. So he went searching for his brother and he couldn't find him for two years, three years. So he went back to the place where he said goodbye and took a stone there and gave me the stone and said, Father Stan, keep this stone on your altar. The church should never forget people. 
because Alejandro went to a priest. The priest could not be seen, could not be heard. The priest was, you know, sometimes it, it takes, it's too, it's too hard to find us priests and bishops. You can try getting an appointment with some of our priests and bishops, and you, get, you know what I mean. So the only way he could see the priest is to go to the confessional. He knew Father would be there on Saturday. And Father was already distressed. We saw the long line. And Alejandro came and said, Father, what is it that I did to God that God took my, my brother away? For four years, I cannot find him. The priest said to Alejandro, your brother is in hell. He's into drug and all this. So he was killed. And Alejandro left the church and never went back. He asked me, where is God in all this? What answer can we give? Because the world is asking that question. Where is God? Theology, one of the oldest definitions of theology that I learned is that theologians are those who show the presence of God. Theology is about showing the presence of God and showing the intelligibility of such a faith in the God that we cannot see. But God has been incarnate in these peripheries, and we are being sent out to go out there. The words of Sister Mary Sodad are the words I use to conclude this lecture. Mary Sodad is a, is a sister of St. Joseph. And he said, when I met with the over 75s, you know, they call themselves the uh, St. Joseph Sisters Elders, Elders Council that I met. He said, there are so many areas of chaos and upheaval in our world today, but we shouldn't lose hope. It is an opportunity for us to see reality with a different eye. I think that is the foundation on which everyone can qualify to be a missionary, constantly seeing reality with a different eye. And that is what conversion means. And as we move from one level of meaning to another, my prayer is that the wisdom of God can lead our hearts and the love of God that love that floods our soul can be the impetus for all that we do. Because when we do that, people also will see in us something greater than Jonah. Thank you very much. Stay nearby. Stay nearby. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dan. Now, really packed. Um, um, talk that you shared with us, bring together many things from your own work and research and from life itself, huh? Okay, and I would like to invite Steve Evans forward. He's, uh, Steve is the former holder of the Lucifer chair and a former faculty member here at CTU, and now he's retired, but still very busy. And I asked Steve if he could chair the, the questions we have here. I'll go to the back and I'll take the questions from the chat that come in on the Zoom. So come forward there, Steve. Okay, thank, thank you very you much, Dan. We have maybe about 10 minutes, yeah. something like that. So, um, uh, so much. <laughs> There's so much there. Uh, uh, it's going to take a while to process uh, everything. Um, I, I don't know if there's a, a mic. Oh, good. Can you have a mic? Okay, good. And you can probably hear me, right? Okay. Um, questions here in, uh, in the group. Yes, please. Uh, I, have Chris two, I have two questions. Uh, my first question on the idea of mission encounter, particular with your question, where is the church and in the context? Over these months, we've been getting uh, over 17,000 migrants from Venezuela here in Chicago. Maybe the number now is higher. I'm not sure. That's the last time I read it. So I asked myself that question and would like to get your opinion if at the time is what, what can we do as a church here in Chicago to welcome, to be present for those migrants who are here with us and will be in our part of the church? And my second question will be, what will be like your inspiration words 
for men like me and women who are preparing to be ministers. And we are called to do that mission or encounter, but unfortunately, because of few priests or ministers, sometimes a priest has to take care of like 20, 30 communities. And like you said, that's why they don't have the time to do like encounter, like the encounter you mentioned about the person who wants to speak to the priest. So what will be some inspirational words for us preparing to be ministers? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for welcoming the, uh, the migrants. You know, um, this is a very complicated uh, issue. We, we saw this so much in uh, El Paso. You know, there is the institute called Hope Institute. And it was started by someone who felt strongly like you did. And he, th he felt that this is not something that you do like um, uh, an emergency, right? So he decided to establish the Hope Institute. And the, and the diocese gave him a former seminary where people are being welcomed with dignity. Because, you know, one, one of the painful things is the way we treat these our brothers and sisters, these siblings of ours. So um, first, to work locally. This is very important. You know, Pope Francis says our task is to work locally. So get some allies with whom you can work together to establish um, an empowering space where they can enter. So that, I think, is something. If you cannot do that, find some uh, churches who are already doing it and volunteer with them. The, the other question about, uh, I don't know if I have words of inspiration. The words of inspiration I give you is the one that Pope Francis gave us. He says, Coraggio, be courageous in doing this work. Sempre avanti, keep moving. Keep moving. Tutto bene all will be well. Because, you know, the world is losing hope. And there's a lot of cynicism out there. But mission is about hope. So um, there's so much to say that I didn't say, which is that the church in North America, and I don't like to make this criticism, but I have studied mission. I have studied how to create community. We are moving away from doing mission and we are doing management. It's painful to know that those who have MDivs are losing jobs in our church, and those who have MBAs are gaining jobs. This is a contradiction, where MBAs are the ones who are running pastoral plan in dioceses. This cannot, this cannot be sustainable. This is not mission where money is first. Mission goes first and money will follow mission. But in many, and I've, I've worked in, in Toronto Diocese. I was part of uh, the, the, the same, uh, uh, the equivalent of Renew My Church here uh, in, uh, in, in, in Toronto. It's called Family of Faith. But a lot of people understood it as that their parish, this is just some kind of a smoke screen to confuse them about closing their parishes. You know, the population here in Chicago is not going down, is it? There is no, the population is stable. So if we are losing members in the church, it's because we are not doing evangelization. It's, just, it's because, I mean, how many parishes in Chicago? Now we've got 263 par parishes or so. How many of these parishes have a youth minister? I studied many churches more than 10 years ago. I did visiting Pentecostal churches. They start in one uncompleted building in one suburb, and they grow. Why is it that some other churches are growing, or why is it that some parishes are growing and some are not growing? So this is the problem that, uh, and then we kind of fall into this uh, category. The church is dying in North America and is growing. No, the church is not dying here. And people should stop saying that. The church is not dying. What is dying is a certain kind of be, a way of being church that people no longer accept. They want a church that is different from management, efficiency, office hour, you know, 
I mean, this is not how to, this, Jesus didn't have uh, office hours, did he? So we can become more like Jesus in this. And so when you see a pastor, I've been a pastor in a parish that we're about to close in Canada. When I was writing my PhD thesis, the bishop said, stand, go there. There are old people. Just celebrate mass for them when you can and write your thesis. When you are finished, I'll close the parish. I said, Mother Mary, do not let this happen. The first parish I ever became in charge of to be closed after me, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be depressed for the rest of my life. So I went to work, knocking on doors. For the first time, I was, char you know, a dog charged at me because I came at night to visit the parishioners. And I told my parishioners, I visit you like the Lord said, like a thief. I come with unannounced with no appointment. I am African. I don't make appointment. The only thing you will see if I come at night, you will see my smiling face. Even if you don't see my face in the dark, you will see a white teeth, right? And surely a dog did not see the smile and, and charged at me. And everything really ended badly because... I practiced I practice a bit of uh, martial arts. So when the dog came, I did a somersault like this, and the dog landed on his back. And the, the, the woman said, oh, no, 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 you can't. Oh, no, I can't welcome you if you did this to my dog. I said, should I have just presented my face? This is okay, dog. Come on, bite my face. I had to do defense. But what I'm saying is, in less than six months, that church was packed. We need to do mission. And rather than just keep on saying, oh, yeah, church is dying here. Uh, church, No. And that means using the whole church. It doesn't have to be priest-centric, bishop-centric church. Use your people. Someone told me recently the Catholic church, is uh, that was in Rome. He said, the church, look at all the gifts we have as a church. And we have failed so woefully in using our gifts. Why? Because we are still operating from an essentialized notion of the ecclesia. And we think things will happen automatically. No, we need to gain our members one at a time. Sorry that I spoke too long, but uh, yeah, it's... Yeah. One more question, Mark. Okay, we'll just do it that way, yeah. Okay, um, most of these are comments and not questions. So there's just a whole string here of thank you, Stan, for such a thought-provoking and inspiring lecture. Thank you, Stan, for this insightful and hope-filled lecture. Thank you very much. It just sort of goes on. There's all kinds. There is one question there. It talks about beyond neighborliness, what do you see as the need and promise of digital mission field? Beyond neighborliness. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, uh, friends, for those uh, Positive comments, you know, uh, I was blushing, but because of my color, you didn't know when you were saying all that. <laughs> so, so beyond neighborliness, I think this digital world, I think the Vatican has really been very proactive in this regard. And I, I like to just mention uh, what we call the Digital Faith Influencer Program that I've been part of. So we have, for instance, more than 6,000 young Africans that I communicate with them and they communicate with each other on this digital space. It is also part of what is leading to the formation of a program that we have designed to train all university level Catholics in Africa on digital, becoming digital influencers. You know, like this idea of digital influencer we took it from social marketing. Social marketing has to do with product, promotion, price, and place, right? So why should the devil have the better part of it? Why should the bad things be the things that are being promoted? Why we have the Lord? So this is what going beyond neighborliness means, where we try to market social good. I mean, I just got the notice from the prefect of the dicastery said, no, Stan, we have to remove marketing from it. Uh, you know, it looks secular. Uh, it looks like we are doing propaganda. So we will call it, I don't know yet, calling call it digital faith market. Uh, you know, he said, no, don't use marketing. We have to find something better. But that is an attempt to do something 
rather than fold our hands and say, well, church is dying, therefore, church is not dying. It's not going to die tomorrow. The Lord promised, I will be with you to, what is the other part? Till the end of the world. So we will have ups and downs, or what I think, uh, um, Steve, you were talking about liquid, liquid uh, mission. So we will, you know, some kind of liquid modernity also. So we will move here, but, but church is not going to die, uh, friends. Let us get ready for work. Everyone get ready to work. Oh, okay, okay, fine. I think, I think with this, uh, Raj, you want to uh, uh, finish, finish off the evening? Okay, okay great. Good. Um, I wish we had uh, more time for more questions, but obviously we're, we're running out of time. You, we're going to have a reception now, so I'd like to invite you for the reception. You'll have a chance to talk more with Stan one-on-one. -on -one. Again, Stan, really thank you so much for all that you were able to pull together and everything like that. So again, we offer him a word of appreciation again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Okay, so let's move to the reception area there.